you guys? Fabulous. Awesome. Good. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, yeah, this is so exciting. So uh, we got some questions and then we're going to throw things to the audience. But I, I just wanted to start by saying, you know, congratulations on the franchise and, uh, you know, being a huge part of the horror community. I want to know what you think it is about the Hatchet franchise that sets it apart from other horror films. Well, I think um, the timing of the first one, because uh, the script went around in 2004, and everybody in town passed on it, because the, like, it got me a lot of work, like writing work, and the response was always, we really like the writing, but this will never get made, because, uh, well, the famous story that a lot of people know um, from a major studio, which I won't say who, um, Come on. Universal Studios. <laughs> said uh, this will never get made because it's not a remake, it's not a sequel, and it's not based on a Japanese one. <laughs> and so I made that the tagline of the poster when it did festivals, and then could not get a meeting at Universal for like six years after that. <laughs> but that was exactly why we wanted it, because if you remember way back in the mid-2000s, everything was a remake, a sequel, a remake of a Japanese movie, or PG-13, and I was like, I really was just sick of the mean-spiritedness, like the torture porn and stuff. Like, it should all exist, and I like all of it. But for me personally, I always liked, you know, Freddy and Michael Myers and Jason and Leatherface, and like, they were, they were fun, even though they were violent and sometimes scary, but they were fun. And so I was trying to just bring that back again to the stuff that I grew up on. So we made it independently, and I screened it for my talent agency at the time. They passed on repping it because they said, uh, we represent film festival movies. This is not a film festival movie. And then I got into Tribeca, and I'm like, I think this could be a franchise. And they're like, it'll never happen. Um, so every step has just been from people telling me no. And like, that's probably the best way to get a product out of me, tell me no, and then I have to do it just to be right. So, um, but it was born in the conventions. For anybody who remembers way back then, uh, I know this is a very young crowd, but we're, well, Kane and I are old. Um, and, but we would go and we would show the clip from the first one of Mrs. Cromatio running away and Kane ripping her head in half. And the audience would, there were some conventions we'd have to show it a second time because the audience would demand to see it again. But I would just tell my story. And, but I was like, convention, convention, convention. And I've been saying ever since then, why aren't more of the newer filmmakers here? Why aren't they doing that? Like, these are our people. These are who we make it for. And then finally, Damien and David from Terrifier, you saw them doing it for the last like three years. <coughs> Everyone had missed the first Terrifier, but then the second one comes out and fucking boom, which is so fucking great to see. So, um, I mean, slashers will never die if they're made, I think, from the right, I guess, point of view or whatever, if they're made with love. And that's, I know people get frustrated because it's so many years between hatchet movies, but we only do it when we're ready to do it. And it's the same people who do each one, and I think that's why the franchise has held up. Yes. Yeah. 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 Danielle and Kane, I wanted to know what was it like working with Adam as a director? Well, Adam's a pain in the ass. <laughs> I, I second that. <laughs> we love him, but he's a pain in the ass. Yeah. No, I mean, we love Adam. You kidding? We do so much shit for for at all. Anytime Adam calls, I'm like, oh god. God, yes, Adam, what do you need? What are we doing? What are we going to be having to do? Are we having to make out again? Are you <laughs> sticking me in the water? And am I going to get cheers on my ass? What's happening? But we gladly do it and show up. I mean, that's honestly, that's what the greatest thing for me in doing horror is 99.9% .9 of the directors are horror fans. You know, they're, they're fanboys or girls. So it's nice to have people that really know it and love it behind the camera. I mean, it's great. I mean, the only thing that was like, you guys put, he put me through hell because he didn't cast me in the first one. 
even though I auditioned for it, and then came back for the second one, and I didn't have an opportunity to like ramp up like most actors do. You normally start somewhere, and then you build up, and then something happens, and then you become the final girl and have to fight the bad guy. I just sort of like started day one in the water, literally, with all the goose poop and <laughs> disgustingness, and oh yeah, oh my god, it's not pretty and pleasurable. I mean, I've never, I remember like even the, I think it was the opening of, I think it was three, where, I think it might have been one of the first days too, and it was you and Pentagraft, and it was when I was, you know, hatching his head open. You guys have those like um, pressure cannon things for your blood. <laughs> And the camera was pointing up at me, and they were down holding this, and it was just on me, and it was, they just went to town. It was, I mean, I was choking. I had so much blood, I was choking to death. And see how he's laughing right now? So <laughs> funny. That's literally what's happening, and they're like, okay, cut, and everybody's high-fiving and laughing and running around, and I'm, I'm just standing there, fucking drenched in it. So there's a lot of like, oh, crap, I forgot I'm making a movie. It's, this is so much fun, that effect was so great, but. I mean, that's why we do it. Yeah, there was, there was a very important, for anyone who doesn't know the whole story, so Danielle auditioned for the first one, and when she walked in, of course I knew who she was, and I'm like, holy shit, it's Jamie Boyd, this is awesome. Um, but at that point, because Mary Beth was the last person I cast, and there were already so many like horror stars in the movie, there was like, obviously Kane was like the very first to get the ball. <laughs> But then, like, Robert England was going to be in it, and Tony Todd was going to be in it, and Josh Leonard from Blair Witch Project, and Mercedes McNabb from uh, Buffy, and even John Beekler doing the effects and his legacy. And I was worried, because the movie's all so funny, that people would think it's like a spoof of horror movies if I had one more horror legend. So we went back and forth, and ultimately I went with an unknown named Tim Othelman, who was great. But then when the sequel happened and the first one had become a big success, she took like some really bad advice from agents who thought like now she was this huge star. Um, and it just wasn't gonna work out. And I'm like, now what do I do? Because I, I remember you called me, I was shooting Stakeland in upstate New York. And you're like, hi. Um, so yeah, um, I know I didn't cast you, but Well, no, so, I've never had to eat more shit on a phone call, and she goes, yeah, she goes, admit you were wrong. Uh, <laughs> and I'm like, I was wrong. But, but it was also my first opportunity, he gave me my first opportunity of being a lead in a, in a horror franchise again. I mean, I really, I mean, I wasn't, I didn't have a huge part in Rob's Halloweens. I mean, this is really the biggest character and the most, like, acting flexing I've been able to do since Halloween 4 and 5. And the position I was in, it's like, what do I do now? Because there were three movies planned from the get-go. We even showed the weapons he was going to use in 2. When you go back and watch part 1, you see the big chainsaw behind Ray Beth and the Barn. Like, it was all planned out. Um, even down to the fact that Victor Crowley is half black, like that's why his hair is the way it was. And, like Kane knew that, and John Beekler knew that, but no one else knew the full backstory yet. But now I'm like, do I scrap all that because the actress is going to have to change? Because nobody likes it when the you know something's a big change like that. So I'm like, yeah, but it's me, right? <laughs> it's not like, like she's replacing me. She would have been fucked. Right? <laughs> The only way this is going to work is if we go to the greatest screen queen of our generation, and then, because initially when fans are like, wait, the same person's not, oh wait, who is it? Oh, all right, great. And then it was just like, boom. when you guys, Wardrobe went and got her clothes out of storage from Wardrobe. I mean, she's way taller than me. She's taller and skinnier, and they were like disgusting still, like crunchy, gross. We forgot to wash them. <laughs> So we, we finessed it. Uh, Kate, what was it like for you the first time that you had everything put on and you looked at yourself in the mirror before going to set? Um, well, I mean, first of all, it was 
an amazing process just working with Adam from the beginning. And, you know, you play a character like Jason, who has had six films before uh, I ever started. So, it, you know, I kind of didn't want to discount what had been done, but I still wanted to kind of make it my own. But working with Adam and the Victor character, you know, we could, I could have a lot of input as to character traits and stuff like that. And, you know, nobody has seen the character. So it was really enjoyable to develop that from the beginning. And when I first read the script and, <clears throat> you know, I see, I'm gonna grab a woman from behind and rip her head apart by her jaw. I said, boy, that's for me. Um, <laughs> I didn't think anybody would be as fucked up in the head as I am, but Adam beats me. Um, not, not literally, but... Um, <laughs> and, you know, then we did some makeup tests, and, you know, I saw sketches of the makeup, what we were hoping to do, and I thought it looked pretty terrifying. And, you know, it, it's a long makeup process, three and a half hours of putting the stuff on every day before you start shooting. Most people's work day is almost halfway done, and mine hadn't even started by the time I was ready to get on camera. But the, the makeup looks so good and so terrifying that it was really fun to be a part of something like that from the beginning. And then you, when you see that there's such an abrupt end to the film, the first one, that is something that most people can't pull off. This is a new franchise. Everybody thinks they're going to do more than one, and most of the time it doesn't happen. But for Adam to have the confidence that he could abruptly end it without really um, coming to a conclusion in the first one because he wanted to pick up the second movie from that moment, I thought was incredibly uh, risky, but it showed me how much dedication he had to the, the story and the character, and I just think it was a brilliant way to do those first three films like that. And, and I, I know I asked you this before, but I don't remember, did you always, have the idea of having Perry Shin in every film from the beginning? Once we were halfway through shooting the first one and he had said, my brother hooked me up with this job, I was like, I'm gonna bring him back as the brother, we'll just put some facial hair on. Because Perry Shin, I, said, I don't know if any of you guys have ever gotten to meet him at a con, he's on General Hospital, so he doesn't get to do that many cons. But he is like one of the greatest human beings you could ever meet, and he makes every set better, and he's just so professional. And the night before we started filming Hatchet One, he had, his daughter was born. And so the rest of us were like, I think we were like 30, most of us, a lot of the cast was like 21, 22. So it was like a giant party, not for me, because my heart's in my throat, and I'm like sick, and I'm like, oh, I didn't make my day, and I got the shots, and the fuck. Um, but the Caps was partying all day long, and then we would shoot all night, and Perry would have to go home and take care of a newborn. And this is, I'm sort of going on a tangent here, but when I wrote the sequel, I'm like, I named the character after your daughter. And he's like, oh, really? I'm like, yeah, her name's Avery. And then he reads the script, and he calls me back, and he's like, so, um, did she have to be getting fucked from behind by a headless corpse? <laughs> And I'm like, oh yeah, oh that happens too. Um, he's like, I'm gonna have to wait a bit to show her this one and tell her she's named after it. <laughs> but then when we were doing the second one, it was like, I, I, he had to die, of course, but I'm like, I'm just gonna bring him back and just make it a joke where someone says, like, it kinda looks like, oh, we all look the same, don't we? But, um, so obviously, Andrew's character in Hatchet 3 is the survivor. It's almost like he's learning through the movies, even though these different characters, like how to survive one of these, like fucking hide. 
Like Marcus has the right idea on the first one, climb a tree, at least you'll see them coming. Um, but uh, it, if you, all right, for those who don't know, in the fourth movie, his character's promoting a book called I Survivor. And it's a big story point in the film that he's like doing autograph signings for his book, even though a ghost writer was assigned to him and there might be some stuff in it that isn't true and he gets called out on that in the film. So we actually did write the book. Um, I think there's three left at my table right now. You can buy it on Amazon, it's an audio book as well. But I was like, how cool would it be if fans could actually own that book and it's a yeah. real book and it's his autobiography. And it fills in everything that happened between Hatchet 3 and 4. So you see what happened in those 10 years. And it might set up things to come. And so on the tour, you can get the hardcover version and everyone bought the book and the book is sold really well, but every time people bring it to my table and I'm like, so what did you think? They're like, what? Like, what the book? They're like, oh, I didn't read it. <laughs> Why? They're like, eh, I'm reading. <laughs> there's a, we even printed it really big. And I'm like, there's, there's an audio book. <sighs> Can you just tell me? And I'm like, no. I wrote the book twice because I didn't think it was good enough the first time. So I scrapped it and wrote it again. I, I cared so much about this book, and so many of you guys own it and never read it. It's like, oh, no, I just put it on my shelf. Sweet. How do you think, Ari, how much time do you spend thinking about creative ways to kill people? Um, if I'm like at a supermarket or. Uh, <laughs> They randomly pop into your head. Yeah, watching the news. Yeah. Um, I just get so angry. And then I, um, the, the thing is like, okay, so a lot of people were so disappointed when they first met me, like before Allison was out, people knew what I looked like, because they'd see the movies, and then they come, and I, usually my dog is with me, and like my fucking Yankee candles, and, my, and they're like, you're the you're the like, Yeah, like, oh, do you have any tattoos? And, no. Like, but they're expecting like Rob Zombie and then they get this, you know. It's great. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know how I come up with such violent stuff. But to me it's it's funny because it's not realistic. I don't really like realistic um, stuff. I do it sometimes like Frozen or Spiral, like more serious stuff. But I just think of like what haven't I seen or what have I seen that, that I think could go further. And then I usually run it by Kane and the effects team. The effects team immediately says no, because like the rule is it has to be practical. Like I don't want to do CG kills. We can like remove a cable or something like that, but no CG kills. So in two, the chainsaw up through two guys at the same time. I'm like, I've never seen that. That could be really funny. And um, the, the, the initially Pentagraph was like, there's no way to do this. Like there's no way. And then a week later, after he had like quit three times and come back, he's like, all right, I think I figured it out. And so that kill, um, oh, which by the way, we're gonna show you guys something really interesting. Um, okay, so that kill, the chainsaw, it's a redwood chainsaw, it weighs 125 pounds. So even Kane can't carry that, like it's impossible. So there's two other dudes who have it on a cable that's running through the top of the stage and they're walking with Kane. The blade is obviously put in in post because you can't, unfortunately, put a spinning chainsaw blade between two actors' legs. Fucking rules. <laughs> and, and then the two actors have to be flown in harnesses so that they'll lift up with the blade at just the right time. And then you need the dummies that are going to come apart on a PVC pipe once you cut behind it. And you really only get one shot at it. And the blood is spraying all over Kane, spraying everywhere. I mean, we destroyed that sound stage. It was so awesome. There was a bunch of everywhere. <laughs> and, um, and it worked. But they only had a female harness for Colton Dunn. Do you remember this? And like the amount of pain that he was in. Same thing happened to Sean Ashmore for some reason on Frozen. And um, he was in so much pain. So like the screaming and stuff is all real. Um, <laughs> so, but then we added the testicles rolling down because we knew we needed to give the MPAA something to go after. <laughs> and I'm like, so they'll, they'll get all upset about that and we'll cut it, but then the balls are going to come back and hatch it three. And they're like, stop it. No, they're not. I'm like, no, 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 trust me, it's going to be really funny. There's going to be balls hanging from a tree. And I'm like, what the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> um, and then in three, uh, it was, so the police go in first and came kills them all, and then the SWAT team shows up. 
And it's described in the script as a forest of gore. So there were supposed to be intestines and body parts and stuff, and that's where the balls were going to come into it. <laughs> this is such a stupid conversation. That's where the balls were going to come into it. And, um, and so it took six hours and like a ton of the budget to create the forest of gore. The crew, so for all my stuff, the crew shirts are always takes on concert shirts. So for Hatchet 3, it was like the Slayer logo. And then on the back, it lists all the shoot dates at like as if they're tour stops. So um, it says Forest of Gore. That was the title of the tour. And right before we started shooting, it wasn't a hurricane, but like this massive tropical storm came through and washed away our whole set. So all of it was gone. And so all we had left were the balls. <laughs> and that's why I'm really when Cody Snyder's like, these are fucking some of these balls hit for trees. Balls are not supposed to be hit for trees. <laughs> um, it worked, but it was supposed to be this, this crazy thing, and we never got to see it. While we're talking about this, though, what I wanted to show you guys, and sorry, I know these are like weird tangents. A lot of people discovered the Hatchet movies later. They didn't see them in theaters. Hatchet 2 famously got yanked from all theaters which is, a, that would be a whole panel in itself. But they fuck with these movies so hard, and I don't know why, because they're harmless. So when the first one came out, and it got an NC-17, I was devastated, and we went back and forth, I want to say 11 or 12 times, cutting stuff out, but they were changing the tone of the movie. They were actually making it worse, like making it more serious because there's a difference between going too far where that's funny and then keeping it realistic. So, uh, on streaming, Amazon, um, I think whenever they were on maybe Hulu or something, they don't tell you that you're seeing a censored version. You don't know that. So a lot of people are seeing these films for the first time and they don't even realize they're not seeing the actual movie. So like on the first one, so I famously um, went to trial over the first one thinking I could beat them. And there's no, it's a, you can't win. But I thought I could. And because I thought I had a good point. I'm like, right now everything's torture and it's mean spirited and depraved. No one even smokes a cigarette in the first Hatchet movie. There's no sex. Nothing in this is realistic. It's a bunch of comedians. The blood is like Monty Python. I'm like, why are you being so hard on this one? And it was because it was independent. And so there's a documentary called This Film Has Not Yet Been Rated by Kirby Dick. If you ever get a chance, watch it. Those are the exact people I faced off with. So I go to the trial. It's supposed to be 12 industry professionals who are just there to watch the movie and decide were you treated fairly. Not to rate it, just were you treated fairly. And they walked in 12 senior citizens. And one dude was in a walker. And like the screen is here, and he's like looking there. And they said, um, the film you're about to watch is called Hatchet. And they all go, ugh. And I'm like, still, I'm like, I've got this. And uh, they played the movie, and I had seen it all over the world at this point, in every country, and there's certain jokes that didn't matter if you spoke the language or not, people laughed. And I think the joke they didn't laugh at was um, when Richard really says, oh, you're making a movie, and Joel Murray goes, oh, you ever hear of uh, Bobby Beavers? And Richard really goes, sure, no. Um, no one laughed, and from the back of the theater, I went, come on! <laughs> And so then I got 15 minutes to make my case. Joan Graves, who was the head of the MPAA, gave her case. And I used as examples, I used um, Saw, Hostel, and the remake of The Hills Have Eyes. And especially the remake of The Hills Have Eyes. I'm like, listen, look, this scene, they rape the mother, suck on her breast until she lactates into the, the bad guy's mouth. They bite the head off the family parakeet, drink its blood, and run away with the baby that they're gonna eat while dad is crucified and on fire outside. And no one in that theater is laughing. And you guys gave that an R. But this, with a gas-powered belt sander, which doesn't exist in real life, and a undead swamp ghost, like, how is this fair? And I'm like, I did it. And then Joan Gray stands up and goes, has anyone in here seen the films that Mr. Green just referenced? And they all, of course, say no. And then she goes, those are stricken from the record. Duh. They even banned the poster, the black poster that's just the hatchet blade, and said it's pornographic. Like, so I had to change everything. So when that movie opened in theaters, that opening night, it was so exciting to go to the Arclight Theater in Hollywood and buy a ticket. Like, we did it, we're in theaters. 
and then watched this movie play that had like nothing left in it. And so with Hatchet 2, I'm like, don't let's not put this in theaters. I just want to go straight to video so I can do what I want. And Dark Sky was like, absolutely. So I fucking went for it. And then all of a sudden they're like, we got great news. The movie's gonna be in theaters. So I'm like, oh, no. But they're like, no, 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 it's good. AMC has just started this new thing called AMC Independent. It doesn't need a rating, so it's gonna play in major multiplexes. That'll be the first time since George Romero's Dawn of the Dead that a horror movie plays without a rating. And I was like, oh my god, I finally win. This is great. Well, um, when you do press, they bank the interviews. Sometimes they'll do the interview a month in advance. All of a sudden, the week that Hatchet 2 is coming out, we get word from AMC, stop talking about the rating. Now, if you've ever seen the trailer for Hatchet 2, it's like, buckets and buckets of blood, like gore, like you've never seen. And the whole thing was that it was unrated. And I'm like, what? And they're like, just stop. If, they, if a journalist asks, we're gonna jump in, there's a publicist from AMC on the phone, a publicist from Dark Sky, and they'd be like, so this is exciting that the movie's coming out with that, and they'd both be like, no, 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 we're, just, we're not talking about that. So I knew something was amiss. And then uh, Entertainment Weekly ran a story. <laughs> There's a picture of me with duct tape over my mouth, and it says, Adam Green calls the MPAA evil. And I'm like, oh shit. <laughs> I had done that interview a month before, and I had told this whole story. So Hatchet 2 opened on Friday night. Danielle was in, I think you were in New York. Kane, you were, were you here in Florida? Or you were somewhere. I was in LA, Tony Todd was in, I think, Chicago. Like, those midnight screenings alone, if that was it, it would have already done well. And then on Saturday, gone. It just wasn't there anymore. And on, I think it was like still MySpace and Twitter back then. And people are like, I just went to my theater, it's not there. Like, and we have no idea what's going on. But they pulled it from all screens. And then somebody from, from AMC said, oh, it wasn't performing. That's not a thing. Movies don't get pulled like every, it's ever here of Waterworld. <laughs> but those are real bombs. And a movie opened that same weekend called Chain Letter, a horror movie, then made $32 per screen and stayed for two weeks. So um, it was devastating and I couldn't say anything. My lawyers are like, you're gonna make other movies, you gotta work with the studio system, let other people have this argument now. And I just sit there and watch when people are like, Adam Green pulled his own movie from theaters as a stunt to publicize. Like it's, I love that people think I'm that powerful. But, you know, um, but the R-rated version of Hatchet 2, which is what most people see when you stream it instead of buying the Blu-ray, um, or seeing it on a place like Screenbox or Shutter, where they make sure that you're seeing the real version. This is what happens. I hope we really do have this clip, but I didn't just set yes, up we, two minutes. We do have the clip, correct? Okay. That was so one of those. First, you're going to see the R-rated version, which is what the MPAA wanted you to see, and then you're going to see the real version. Now, for some of you, this might be the first time you even see the real version based on where you streamed the film. Um, but you'll see they changed the whole tone of it because hitting somebody in the mouth with a hatchet three times is kind of fucked up. But hitting them 30 times is hilarious. <laughs> Sorry that it's stuttering, I don't know what's wrong. So be careful what you stream, because they don't tell you. Um, because I've been making a mistake about this, I've noticed that Amazon now will say R-rated version. Um, so you still would have to know, though, that there is an unrated one. Um, but they make you, I think, pay a dollar to see the unrated one. Um, in Victor Crowley, there's the bookstore scene where a dude whips out his dick and asks Andrew Young to sign it. That was a very, it was, it was more than a joke to me, because it was a commentary that it's always gratuitous female nudity. So I'm like, I'm gonna do gratuitous yes. male nudity. Yeah. And throughout the tour, women thanked me afterwards for doing that. They're like, you know, it's about time. And then the movie comes out, and they, again, they didn't say unrated or rated, and there were reasons for that, because if it's unrated, you can't be on the front page of new releases on iTunes or Apple or whatever it was, so they just didn't say anything. And they don't show the dick. 
Did now, you have a casting session for the day? We did. Who <laughs> the day? Awkward. Um, Sarah. It was odd that it was like a three-week casting session. <laughs> I don't know if that was necessary, was it? We, oh man, we in the course have bad luck with nudity. Um, I can't tell this story, I'll get canceled. Um, okay, so I can't, I can't, I can't. Come to my table, I'll tell you about it. Um, uh, but I said, fine, if you're gonna cut the dick, you have to cut the, the boobs out as well. I'm like, you can't. And they're like, no, 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 the boobs are fine. I'm like, uh, yeah, I know. You have to cut that too. And they did, in Dark Sky's defense. And they listened to me. And so when you see that version, it's just framed above the girl lifting her shirt. And she says, can you, can you sign one of them to my dad? <laughs> um, anyway, uh, yeah, but the dick was cut out. And then there were women that wrote to me on um, social media that were like, I'm really disappointed that you backed down. And I'm like, it's not me, it's not my fault, but I'm not allowed to say that because it's interfering with business and I could get sued, so I can't say any of this stuff. Now it's been enough years, no one's gonna care. But, so, point is though, be careful what you stream because sometimes you might not be seeing the actual movie. Thank you for showing us, I mean, Kane, of course, you're brilliant, but he's, thank you. Amazing. That was an exhausting scene, by the way. <laughs> Whether it's a fake hatchet or not, swinging it that many times, and that was one take that uh, I got pretty cranky. <laughs> so the next scene was extra violent, but. I don't think people realize how tough they actually are. Like, maybe with Kane, they do. But Danielle, man, in Hatchet 3, some of the shit she had to do, being hung from that tree at the end with the impalement. And then when they were letting you down and they like dropped you, and she's getting eaten alive by ants the whole time, too. Like if somebody went to the emergency room every night of Hatchet 3, Kane had to go one night, he like stopped breathing from the blood He drove himself to the emergency room. And he drove himself. Not so much of a bad ass scene. So like, we'll take you to the hospital. He's like, I'll drive. <laughs> Should we try to take a couple questions from the crowd? All right, now is your opportunity. Whatever questions, clearly nothing is off limits here today. So, uh, all right. First victim, what's your name, what's your question? Hello. So I have one unserious question, but then a serious question. So Adam, is it Market Basket or Market Basket? It's Market Basket. Market, market basket. basket. Market Market Basket. Yes. Somebody made me, uh, I'm wearing it right now, uh, somebody gave me this on Friday, it's a Market Basket uh, bracelet that says Market Basket on it. So thank you if you're in here, whoever you're in. I like the shirt, I have my new bracelet on the back. Yes. Love it. Uh, so my serious question, because I, I love Holliston, obviously, my favorite is the Holliston Hop Goblin episode. Yeah. I love that episode. Uh, but We're so are, wasted. We're so from on the set memories, because you're all incredible on the show. Oh my god, he's in the bed, it's so weird. It's too weird. <laughs> I think that will forever be one of the, the funniest moments of my life. Absolutely. Like, when I wrote that, and that's the benefit to being able to write parts for your friends. Like, I knew that they would find it as funny as I did. And the fact that these guys, uh, and, and like Tony Todd and, and um, Sid, and that like, that they play such messed up versions of themselves. Because there's some actors that are way too pretentious to do that. But that Danielle's like using me to get my bike in and then <laughs> going to the dentist to get teeth pulled because I think she's gonna date me. Oh, thanks, um, boo. Yeah. <laughs> um, but shooting that scene was so, when she walks out in the, in the clown costume, but then when Kane runs in and just sees what's going on and is like, oh yeah. And then in the script, it said Kane lists a bunch of other horror celebrities that they've done this with before. And then he made he came up with the list. And the fact that Angus Strim was on the bottom of this orange team, like the oldest man, like and for anyone who got to meet Angus while he was still here with us, just the sweetest guy. And then he was involved in these orgies that happened at conventions. But, but to have a threesome between myself wearing that s and Michael Myers mask, which somebody cosplayed as yesterday, it was amazing no. to see. 
and they did such a good job with it too. I have the original in my office, but with Danielle like beating me up, slapping me, and like banging my head against the headboard, but then Kane on the bed too, and like, um, and even like continuing it out into the apartment when Joe hits me with the frying pan and the whole thing. That, as a horror fan, like that was like the funniest thing I'd ever seen, let alone be involved in. But also too, there's so much about that. Like Danielle's willingness to make fun of herself like that. Again, like a lot of people, they just, they just wouldn't, you know? And then for the Freddy versus Jason joke with, with Kane. Yes. But it's like, once you make this joke, because that was a fucked up situation, like in real life. But once you make this joke, you own it now. You control that situation, and it can never hurt you again. You know, and he, but he got that, and, and then owned it and went for it, and it's so fucking funny every time he starts like, you know, spazzing out, and he also cut his own head open. Um, it's candy glass when you hit yourself with it, and the second take, he sliced his head open, and once again, we're like, shit, he probably should go to the emergency room, and he goes, just give me some super glue. <laughs> All right, so and everyone's like, did he just? I'm like, yeah, he did. Just, just go. Just shoot. Right, well, thank you guys. Yes, I would still love to see shin pads. I would love to see shin pads. But, but if we ever did it, it would never live up to what you guys have in your mind. So the whole, we were never, the plan was that we were never going to actually, something would always go wrong where the audience wouldn't get to see it. But in France, these guys made it. And it's called Goal of the Dead. I, I don't know, if, I'm sure you can find it somewhere, but it's Shin Pads, the, the real movie. I'm gonna look for that, thank yeah. you guys. Right, we have time for this one more question. Sure. All right, no, you're fine. Hello. Hi. Um, so I know Kane was talking a lot about this uh, prior, like how he loves like really like gnarly kills and stuff, but um, out of all three of you, like even if it's not a movie you're in, what are your favorite kills of all time in any film you've seen? Features for it so that there's 
new stuff. And because uh, this is the first time that, because right now technically Lionsgate has the rights to Hatchet 1 because it wasn't Anchor Bay, it was owned by Stars, it was acquired by Sony. <laughs> Lionsgate, right? Yeah. Um, but that's why you never see theatrical screenings of Hatchet 1. It's always the sequels because they want like a ridiculous amount of money to, to do a theatrical screening. That's also why you barely ever see screenings of Hellraiser, the original one. Have you ever noticed that? Like, why don't? They do more retro screening than Lionsgate. Please hire me, Lionsgate. Don't hate me for that. Um, but one of the things, I don't know if anyone in here is going to remember this, but when we were making the first movie, there was a website. It was just like hatchet.com, or I think it was victorcrowley.com, because the movie was originally called Victor Crowley. And uh, it was um, a tree with scary sounds. And if you hovered the mouse over certain things, you'd hear like a chainsaw and someone screaming, or you'd hear him crying for his father. And then as we started shooting, the cast and crew was writing journals every night. And I didn't, I didn't know what the hell I was doing back then, so I was showing everything. We had a, the only movie we ever had a, a professional set photographer on set for every second of the making of the movie. So everything is like beautiful photographs. And we were posting the pictures of what we shot that night, the storyboards, like giving it all like away. Um, but back then there was only a few thousand people that were aware that this movie was being made and it was coming. So as soon as Edgar Bay bought Hatchet One, they erased that website and it was just annihilated. But I didn't know until like four months ago when we were working on the re-release of Spiral that's coming early next year. Um, yeah, it's gorgeous. Gorgeous, and the special features are going to be awesome. Um, I found that I had printed off all those journals before they deleted it. So what we're going to do is have the cast read their journals, like in their voices, and show all those behind-the-scenes pictures that no one's ever seen. And you're going to see the making of the first one through the <laughs> cast and crew's own words. And Kane only wrote one journal because he stayed away from the cast for the whole making of it. And, which was very effective because they all thought he legitimately was crazy. And they were so <laughs> but speaking of that kill that he still says is his favorite, um, we haven't actually talked about this yet. He says, uh, this is my best work I've ever done and I stake my reputation on it. And, and he wrote, <laughs> so even, even the cast and group, they don't know about this box set yet. This is the first, like, anyone's hearing about it, but it's not supposed to be announced yet, so please don't post it online. You can, once it does get announced, you can say, I knew first, or whatever, but just please don't. Because um, I'll get in a lot of trouble, and then they won't let me come to conventions anymore. <laughs> I never, I barely get to go to them anyway. So, um, but it's so great, 17 years later, that you had made such a bold statement then, and you still say it now. I'm uh, still standing by it, and I, I, I kind of forgot when, until we watched uh, two versions of the trailer that when you hear the disembodied voice saying, Daddy, it's a mix of my voice and my oldest son's voice, because he was quite young at the time, and I think that's kind of cool for... And, and my voice. It's the three of us. Yeah, um, someone asked this two weekends ago at Monster Palooza, which I thought was incredible that someone would remember. But in Hatchet 2, 3, and 4, it's like the voice that you just heard in that clip. And uh, in Hatch Hatchet 1, when it did festivals, it was that voice. But for some reason, the theatrical release and the Blu ray and DVD release, it's this other voice that's this weird, ghostly voice that the sound designer, who is brilliant, he's won two Emmys now for Game of Thrones, um, he changed it because he thought it would be better, and it was in surround sounds. So if you saw actually one of the theater, Victor Crowley's voice like swirled through the theater, it was, uh, it was amazing what he did, but when you watch it on the home system, it just sounds like this sort of a highly affected ghost voice, like more of a like whisper, like, like that, but I love that we went back to that original one because the mix, especially with Jace, with Jace's voice, that innocent little boy's voice, and now, if you didn't already know about that, next thing you watch the movie, if you 
are paying attention, you'll hear it clear as that. But I love that the little the little boy who's scared and tortured by people and bullied, that you hear that so loud and, and clear if you know to listen to it. Because the best villains, you have to have some sort of sympathy for them. If they're just evil because they're evil, you can only go so far with that. But Victor Crowley's a very tragic character. He didn't ask for this. It's not his fault. And he's paying for the sins of his father because his father cheated on his mother when she was sick and the whole thing and the curse. But same thing with Mary Beth, where it's because her father was involved in bullying Victor Crowley and ultimately how he died that she's now paying for his sins. So that moment at the end of three when they're standing in front of each other and Mary Beth has the urn and is like crying and saying, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, it's like, it's just not something you normally see in a horror movie. Same thing with like when Tiffany Shepard died in part four with um, the, because everyone's like, why did she have to be pregnant? Like, why did you do that? You made it so much worse. And I was working through my own shit in that, because that was my divorce movie, which is probably very obvious from the opening of it, with two people getting engaged and then fucking slaughtered. Um, <laughs> we'll be together forever. Um, but in that moment, I'm like, all I ever wanted in life was children. And I'm like, I'll never have kids now. Like, my whole life is ruined. And that's why I did that. But so there's, for a slasher movie, there's so much else going on. But when you have real actors doing that stuff, I mean, Kane won, uh, best actor at Fantastic Fest that year. Like, did you ever think that was gonna happen? No, of course not. I mean, you know, you just do what you do and you enjoy doing, but never expected anything like that. And I was very honored. And Danielle bringing this like gravitas to this character, and where it's not just being a badass or screaming or running away, but like in that moment, watching the two of them. Um, same thing with, with you and Tony Todd in the voodoo shop. Um, when Tony Todd tells her the, the real legend of Richard Crowley, we killed the lights and the whole crew just laid on the floor with like pillows and just listened to him in that voice tell that story. But watching Tony and Danielle and that close up and the tears and the, like it's just not what you would normally get from slasher movies. So I'm so sorry. I no, you're fine. Time. I wish you had another hour, but we are out of time. I gotta get you guys back to your booths. I'm so sorry. But our booths are like right near each other in the corner. Yes. Uh, there's still three copies of My Survivor, and uh, but please come say hello. That's why we're all here is to see you. So come say hello. And stop. You know, with the Danielle will sign a um, a hatchet picture, and she's such a lady. She'll write on there, "Die, motherfucker." <laughs> I just found one of those, like, can you write your favorite line from Victor Crowley? I'm like, you don't want me to do that. And they're like, no, 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 it's okay. I'm like, are you going to hang it up? They're Wasn't like, it, why don't you go fist your own ass? No, it was, uh, you sloppy garlic cunt. Yeah. <laughs> Laura Ortiz says it to, um, to Sabrina. She goes, you discount all right, you, you disgusting sloppy garlic cuts. <laughs> was that scripted or was that yeah. scripted? But then Laura teases his little voice, you sloppy garlic cuts. <laughs> you give us the best lines, I always have a hard time picking which one. Well, thank you guys so much. This has been thank so much guys. fun.